camera on. A husband and wife were having a fight. You ever been there? <laughs> the wife decided to go for the silent treatment. She wasn't going to speak to him anymore. Husband realized he was in trouble, a bit of trouble. He wrote on a piece of paper, wake me up at 6 a.m. I have a flight. The next morning, he woke up at 9 a.m. and missed the flight. Furious, he looked on the bedside table and there was a note there, wake up at 6 a.m. <laughs> Silent message. Wake up at 6 a.m. In Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, there's just a powerful message in that verse. It says, the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Father God, we come before you this morning. Grateful that we're here. Grateful that we're, we have a hungry heart to hear the word. Grateful that you are you. Grateful that we're under you. Pray that we'll always be under you, Lord. We pray for this message and ask that you bless it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this message may, may not be specifically for you, but it can prepare you to answer for some of the things that people might ask you knowing if you're a believer. So these people left God out of their decision. They sampled their provisions, but not inquire of the Lord. They, they left God out of it. They thought they knew what was best. The Israelites had a plan and a directive from God. But they didn't follow it. They got their own idea. And much of Christendom does the same thing today. When I say Christendom, Christian means something very specific to me. But they had their own idea instead of following exactly the directives. So I'm going to start with an outline of the book of Joshua up to this point, which is chapter 9, just so you have a, an overall view of what leads up to this. In chapter 1, Joshua is installed as the leader. And God promised to be with them. Verse 5 and 6. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. The people pledged their obedience to Joshua and to God in, in 1 Joshua 16 and 17. We're still in the first chapter. Then they answered Joshua, wherever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. So let that sink in. They promised to obey Joshua as God's leader. They had also promised to obey Moses. They had a promise to obey what God was doing to, through Moses. Chapter 2, Joshua sent the spies into Jericho. Rahab hood, hid them, you know the story about Rahab. Chapter 3 and chapter 4, God stopped the Jordan River at flood stage. The Israelites crossed over on dry ground to enter in to the promised land. Chapter 5, Joshua 5, 10, and 10 uh, to 12, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Verse 11, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. 
the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. Chapter 6, the Israelites defeated Jericho. God knocked the walls down. Verse 20 to 23. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and, all, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed within with their swords everything living in it, men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother, her brothers and sisters and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Chapter 7 refers to the sin of Achan who uh, took some of the fancy things that he found in Jericho and he, they weren't allowed to take anything. It was all to be destroyed. Chapter 8, the Israelites defeated Ai or Ai. The covenant was renewed on Mount Ebal in Joshua 8, 34, 35. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole community of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. The word. He read the word. I think that Joshua was a scribe, Moses' scribe, and I think he had actually physically written the things that Moses dictated. So it was easy for him to read that because he was in his own writing. That's my theory. But this was important. He read all the book of the law to all of the, of the Israelites. That was the word. At that point, that's all there was to the word. The words of the law that God gave Moses were so important that Joshua read all of it to the community. It was read to everyone. The word was that important. In chapter 9, we find the Gibeonite deception. This is interesting. The first 13 verses, now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, Along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks, old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and they wore old clothes. All the bread and their food supply was dry and moldy. And then they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country. See, that was a lie. We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the highways, but perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? But we are your servants, it said to Joshua. And Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? Here's another lie. Your servants had come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. We have heard reports of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Hezbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned, who reigned in Ashtoreth. 
And our elders and all those living in our country said, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. Lies, all lies. Verse 14 is the worst part of the whole thing. Joshua 9:14. The Israelites sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord. They listened to their enemy, but didn't ask God anything about it. Verse 14, the Israelites sampled their provisions. In other words, they checked out the stuff they were saying. They checked out all the lies. They could see physical evidence, but they didn't inquire of the Lord. How was it that Joshua allowed them to investigate and make a decision without inquiring of God? After all, they had been through. God brought them across the, uh, across the Jordan River at flood stage on dry ground. God ordered them to take Jericho. And all he had to do is do what God said, and it was all good. But these were all lies. Lies, lies, lies. The Israelites trusted lies instead of God. You see that happening today? The Israelites trusted lies. They could have inquired of God, but they did not. Then in verse 16, three days after they made a treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. God had ordered the Israelites to destroy all the Canaanites. This was in chapter 3 and verse 10. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. And then he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. These were the seven condemned nations of Canaan. Joshua 3.10. The seven peoples enumerated here were the principal racial divisions of the fragmented city-states of the land of Canaan. Several times in the Old Testament, these lists appear not exactly as they are here. It's in Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy. The extreme debauchery of the pre-Israelite Canaanites provided a moral ground upon which God found it necessary to destroy them extreme debauchery and God called for their destruction. Shameful sins of mankind until this very day may be traced in part to the failure of Israel to obey the word of God, to inquire of the Lord and the cutting out of the moral cancer of Canaan. God had long ago marked out the Canaanites for destruction. But the reason that it did not occur sooner was that their cup of wickedness had not become full. The degraded character of Canaanite society and religion is more explicitly described in moral and social terms in Leviticus it includes the sexual promiscuity and perversion, particularly associated with fertility cults, as well as the callousness 
of child sacrifice, infant sacrifice. I don't know how they could do that. This is reinforced in the historical text with additional notes about social oppression and violence, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Now, if we take these texts seriously as part of God's own explanation for the events that unfold in the book of Joshua, we cannot avoid their implications today. The conquest was not human genocide. It was divine judgment. What were they doing? Murdering their babies. Burning them alive in a fire in front of a hideous idol. That's what Baal worship was like. That's what Chemosh and Molech worship were like. A screaming little baby being roasted alive in front of a hideous demon. How could they do that? How could they? They worship Baal, Moloch, and Chemosh by burning infants alive. They worship Asherah with shrine prostitutes. This is from a site online called Got Questions. Here are the reasons scripture gives for a commanding ancient Israel to annihilate certain people groups. First of all, to judge the Canaanites for their abominations. The Canaanites were a brutal and wicked culture that frequently engaged in incredibly decadent behavior. They just weren't another group of people. We, we might tend to look at them that way, but they were not. Leviticus 18 provides a list of sins that Israel was to avoid and at all cost. Incest, child sacrifice, homosexuality, and bestiality. All these sins were practiced by these people of Canaan. This is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. All these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. That's in Leviticus chapter 18. Sounds like what people are doing today, doesn't it? In ordering the destruction of the Canaanites, God enacted a form of corporal, corporate capital punishment on the people that had been deserving of God's punishment, God's judgment for some time. God had given the Canaanite people over 400 years to repent, started in Genesis 15. Then came Judgment Day. God could have used any means to destroy the Canaanites, but he chose to use the Israelites as the instrument of judgment. This method not only rid the world of an evil and deeply depraved society, but it also provided a ready-made home for God's chosen people, the Hebrews. The Canaanites knew what was coming and had heard of God's awesome power. Such awareness should have prompted a repentance, but they remained resistant to God. The Canaanite, Canaanite Rahab was saved, and so was her family, and they are proof that the Canaanites could have avoided destruction if they had repented. No person had to die. God's desire is that the wicked turn from their sin rather than perish. But they did not. Their culture as a whole 
was opposed to God. Their whole culture was against God. Second, to stave off idolatry and compromise, immediately after God commanded that the Canaanites be completely wiped out, God gave the reason. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods and you will sin against the Lord your God. The reason for the extermination was to prevent religious compromise and spiritual adultery. If the, if the Israelites left survivors, the sin of idolatry would follow. And it did. The Israelites failed in their mission and left many Canaanites alive. Exactly what God said would have happened occurred. Israel compromised with the Canaanites' culture and fell into idolatry time and again. God's order to exterminate the Canaanites was meant to guard his relationship with his people. Number three, to prevent future problems. God knows the future. God knew what the results would be if the Israelites did not completely eradicate their enemies. The Amalekites were not Canaanites, but they attacked Israel several times and forged alliances with the Canaanites, so they also fell under God's judgment. King Saul was given the responsibility to exterminate the Amalekites. Saul shrieked, shirked his duty, and lied about it. The results were dire. Just a couple of decades later, there were enough Amalekites to take David and his men's family captive. Several hundred years after that, a descendant of the Amalekites, Haman, tried to have the entire Jewish people exterminated. You can find that in the book of Esther. So Saul's incomplete obedience almost resulted in Israel's destruction. If Saul had obeyed the voice of the Lord, it would have saved David's men and the Jews of Esther's day a whole lot of trouble. Number four, to fulfill the curse of Canaan, centuries before Moses' command to eradicate the Canaanites, Noah had cursed one of Haman's sons. Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. Canaan was the ancestor of the Canaanites. The descendants of Canaan included the Sidonians, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, you know what they were doing. Noah's curse prophecy came true during the time of Joshua. The Canaanites were conquered by the Israelites who were descended from one of Ham's brother Shem. Not all of the Canaanites were exterminated. True to God's word, some of the Canaanites became slaves. The most difficult part of the command is that when the Canaanites were exterminated, women and children were not spared. Why would God order the death of non-combatants and innocent children? Have you ever had that question in your mind? It came to my mind until I researched this. Here are some things to remember. No one is innocent in, sen in the sense of being sinless. These women were participants in the degrading sins of Canaan, and the children would have grown up sympathetic to evil religions and practices of their parents. 
So if the Israelites had carried out what they were supposed to do, those children, being innocent, would have gone to God. These women and eventually the children would naturally have been resentful of the Israelites and later sought to avenge the unjust treatment the Canaanite men had received. In the end, God is sovereign over life, all of life. He can take it whenever and however he sees fit. God alone can give life and God alone has the right to take it. God is under no obligation to extend anyone's life or even another day or another minute. How and when we die is completely up to him. In the case of the Canaanites, their end came after a time of tolerance and patient grace. But Judgment Day finally came to all and it came to the Canaanites via the Hebrew people. You decide. If you decide based on your own, if you, if you make decisions based on your own sensibility, God wants you always to come to him. They did a little research. They checked out the people's provisions, but they did not ask God. They put God out of the situation. They put him out. We live in a depraved culture. Admit it. And it's getting worse. This culture is depraved. Just like that culture was. This culture might as well be called Canaanites. <coughs> what were they doing that we don't see today? Leviticus 18, 21 to 28, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourself any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. It was very specific. Sacrificing babies. We just don't wait till they're born. Homosexuality. It's, it's, it's rubber stamped. It's okay. It's not okay. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the foreigner right residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Which happened? Murdering babies. Depraved sexual practices. You know, the powers that be want us to think that's just an, all, that's just an alternative. Gender. They have some nerve to call it gender care when they want to administer puberty blockers to children without their parents knowing about it. Call that gender care. Hide it from the parents. 
You know, if they're, if they're, if they're adults and they want to mutilate themselves, that's okay with me, but I don't want to pay for it. I just sometimes just shake my head. Marxism. For even when they were with you, you gave this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. <laughs> you get what you get because of the work you do. And there's many instances of, of property ownership in the Bible. They owned the vineyards. It wasn't, it wasn't socialism. It wasn't Marxism. Marxism hates God, hates the nuclear family. They want the government to raise the kids. And we're almost there in the schools. And they hate private property. But God approves of all those things. Why has our culture drifted so far from God? Because the powers that be do not inquire of the Lord. We have the same scriptures that Joshua had. We can inquire of the Lord. The powers that be don't think they need God or his scriptures or his influence. It's mankind making up their mind about things without inquiring of the Lord. All they got to do is look it up in here inquiring and I think they used to do that many of them judge God Canada they call this hate speech because it condemns homosexuality and anything that does that is hate speech can you imagine this is God's directive for how we're to live They've been getting away with it, but not for long. Amen? Amen? Not for long. He's coming back. Straighten out the whole thing. Ah, that'll be a day. I'm going to close with this, Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. That's about the best advice I can find in the scriptures. Amen? You can use that advice for almost everything. You hear people going around saying how they choose a church. Well, the, peak, the speaker is dynamic. They've got to have a dynamic speaker. When it runs around back and forth and shouts and everything, show me. Show me. <laughs> show me dynamic speaker. Joshua just read the word to the people. Did it do any good? Not really. Because it was just after that that the Gibeonites came along and they didn't inquire of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Or they want a tall pastor with a mustache. <laughs> or they want a woman pastor. I've known some woman pastors. Awesome. Very good. They have a special heart for ministry. We knew one. I met her a couple of times. She was really tall. She must have been six feet tall. Blonde lady. And she was learning Chinese, and she was going to go to China. And she did. She went to China, and I can speak a few words of Chinese. So the second time I saw her, I said, Ni hao ma. <laughs> she was surprised I knew how to say that. That means, how are you? Ni hao ma peng yo, that, how are you, my friend? That's about, you know, that's about all I can say in Chinese. But I can say to you, in the language of the Mohawk Indians, Gunaronkwa. 
That means I love you. Maybe that should be what you're looking for in a pastor. Of course, you found me. <laughs> but you hear people searching around and going from place to place. Inquire of the Lord. Where should I be? What's important is that you can be in a place where God wants you to be so that you can be encouraged to go out beyond the walls and share the word, share the gospel. That's what's important. Amen. I couldn't stay home today. I felt my body said stay home. I couldn't do that. I had to share this message today. Not that you need to hear it for your own self, but that you need to be prepared to answer things that happen all around you. The Canaanites are about us. The Canaanites are all around us. Inquire of the Lord. There's Christian people who think, oh, that's okay. I just heard one the other day. She, uh, she was a friend of ours. We graduated with her in high school. I found her number. I'm trying to set up a reunion. Called her. It was a nice conversation. She's Methodist. And she said she was going to the Methodist church right across the street. She lives at Erie. I said, is that the one that condones gay marriage? She said, well, yeah, they're all God's children. And I said, no, they're not. I said, you have to become a child of God. John 1, 12. You have to become God's child. You're not automatically God's child. Maybe when you're an infant. I don't think that straightened her out. She wanted to keep going there because she went there for years and years. But the Methodist Church has had a big split over homosexual marriage. The Pope said the same thing. I don't know, some, some time in the last year or so I heard on the news that he condoned gay marriage because, well, they're God's children too. No, they're not. He must never have read John 1, 12, or he ignored it. Some people ignore the parts that speak to them what God wants to say and they read to them that it reinforce what they think but is actually against God. You know what I mean? They can const you can take the Bible and construct a negative message in your own heart. Just ignore the parts where God is. <laughs> well, I'm about done talking now. It's been good to be sitting in front of you considering the alternative because I don't think I could have made it through this on my feet. But I'm going to invite you to stand. Father God, we have come into your house and we have worshipped you. We have praised you. We enjoy being together. You are our God and there is no other. We hope this message speaks something to our hearts that we can use to speak to other people with. We hope we'll be determined always. Determined always, Lord, to stay on God's side of everything and to inquire of the Lord to inquire because you are God and there is no other. So as we go forth today, we ask your blessings on everyone in here, Lord. Everyone in here. So we ask you to grant travelers mercies. Bring us all back safely next time we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. I was going to have a board meeting.